Jamel, I can't tell you how, uh, how excited I am about spending this next uh, few minutes together with you. You know, we go back, we go back a few years now, don't we? We've, uh, you know, we've known each other for quite some time. When we met uh, at, that, uh, at that breakfast meeting for, for leaders, uh, probably, that's probably four years ago now, eh, Jamel, when we first met? Yeah, it is. I, I remember it like yesterday. You were telling a, a story, a very compelling story about a moment in your entrepreneurial journey, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. That was the moment that I knew something was there. I didn't know what it was, but I knew something was definitely there. Well, that's right. And, and, and yeah, I, I think I was maybe telling the story about uh, <laughs> how lonely and how fearful I was in that hotel room in Dallas, Texas, as I was wondering how I was going to meet payroll. Remember that? I mean, it was just a, yeah. a very daunting time in my career that uh, is one of the reasons why I started SEO Global Network is I didn't want anybody else to ever feel that way, right? Like, let's create a, let's create a community of people who want to help each other uh, so that, you know, we don't get into those particular situations. And so, but I, but I remember it and, you know, neither one of us knew that day how our paths would become, you know, uh, crossed intertwined and uh, and here we are you know and we we uh, we're, we're we're working closely together i mean you're such an important part of what uh, what we do and and you know i i really look up to you as an emotional intelligence expert you know if if, if there were three emotional intelligence experts that i had to mention that you know i'd mention of course i'd mention daniel goldman he's not the father of emotional intelligence but he is you know he's he's the person that really uh, made it quite popular when he wrote that uh, that article in hbr and he wrote primal leadership Carolyn Robertson, as you know, I mean, she's been my emotional intelligence guru or, or guide, let's call her my guide in this area for almost 20 years. And, you know, and I'm a work in progress, Jamel. You know, <laughs> I, I, ain't, I, ain't perfect, I don't know how much I, I believe that, but I'll, I'll, I'll say yes, I'll go with it this time. I, I, I'm certainly nowhere near perfect in this area, but it, it is an area of leadership. It's an area of life that, you know, Thanks to you and thanks to, you know, Carol and Daniel, putting it, putting it, uh, putting the spotlight on it, really, uh, so that we can become better leaders, we can become better versions of ourselves. Okay? So, so, so thanks for being here. I want to start before I ask you a couple of questions. I just want to give people on the call um, just a couple of a couple of facts about you. OK, and uh, and, and, you know, the first one is, I mean, you're the founder and the owner of, uh, you know, of, of, of Paradigm, uh, Paradigm People Development. And it's, it is a emotional intelligence training and development company. I mean, this is, this, is, this is what you do. This is your passion. And so I wanted people to know that, you know, your company is Paradigm People Development. And, you know, and, and you know, I know so many people that have worked with you now <laughs> since we met uh, four or five years ago uh, that, uh, you know, in, in many ways, Jamel, you've, you've, you've changed their lives. You've changed their lives for the better. Right? And so how good is that? You, you, you are an official member of the Forbes Coaching Council, and that's, and that's quite a claim to fame. I, I, you know, that, that is uh, good for you for being that because it's not easy to be part of that council. Um, you know, you're involved with the uh, Human Resources Professional Association. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're a, 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 I, I guess you would say a trusted partner, trusted advisor. Uh, of HR professionals across the country, and uh, so so good for you. Uh, uh, the the thing that's so relevant today is, I mean, you've been trained, you've you've honed your skills uh, in this area, and are authorized. You know, you you are you are certified, if you will, uh, with the MHS EQI. Uh, both the 2.0 and the and the EQ 360, and you know that was one of the that was one of the things we we bonded on when we met the first time because you asked me uh, about you know wh what is the tool that is used uh, by Carolyn and CEO Global Network and it, and, it, and it is the MHS tool which is according to Carolyn who's a student of this game too uh, the most scientifically sound emotionally intelligence tool. Uh, you know, assessment tool in the world. And, you know, the people behind that are, are, are brilliant people, as you know, Stephen Stein and so on. So uh, uh, the other thing I want to mention is, is you, you are on our team as our emotional intelligence coach and have, and have coached a number of members of CO Global Network and their teams, right? 
Uh, and then lastly, I just want to mention, uh, and then I'm going to, then I'm going to ask you a couple of zingers, uh, uh, Jamel. But the other thing I want to mention is you're, you are a key part of our global leadership training program. I mean, we've, we put hundreds of people through that global leadership training program. Emotional intelligence and self-awareness is one of the key pillars of that. And you are the person that, uh, that really comes in and teaches those, uh, those leaders uh, you know, emotional intelligence skills does a debrief with them and helps them helps them work on the things they want to work on on this extremely important uh, dimension of leadership, right? So, you know, um, so people on the call, you know a little bit more about Jamel now, and uh, and 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 now you're going to hear from him, which uh, you've been waiting to do. But let's get started, Jamel, with um, let's get started with just a, a pretty open ended question, and 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 that is why is it so important? Like, why is, why is emotional intelligence so important for CEOs and really all leaders, eh? all leaders? And, and can you just kind of give us your thoughts on that, Jamel? Yeah, it's a great question. And in order for me to really be able to answer that, we have to take just one step, one step back and, and make sure that we understand, first off, well, what is emotional intelligence? And I think that there are so many different definitions and ideas and misconceptions about it, that it's helpful to clarify really what we're talking about when we say emotional intelligence or EI or EQ. So essentially, emotional intelligence be, deals with our ability to be smart about our emotions, not only our own, but also the emotions of others. And so if I were to simplify that even more, I would just say that emotional intelligence is basically people skills. It's social skills. How do you interact with others? What is that dynamic like? Are you aware of yourself? Are you aware of others? And are you able to mobilize teams, et cetera, to be able to work together? Fundamentally, that's what it comes down to, people skills and social skills. And so when we think about that as the foundational definition of what it is, then we can now bring it into the context of leadership, of being a CEO, of being at really any executive level, and really even just in terms of being an employee and a human being, actually. <laughs> yeah. And so... When you think of it through that lens, we'll start with the, the CEO and the organization. What we have to realize is that a company is not what we think a company is in our minds. For example, if I talk about Nike, when we think about Nike, we think about that iconic swoosh and we think about their products and we think about the athletes who support their products. But what we forget is that Nike is actually just a building full of human beings. That's what Nike fundamentally is. And that's what every company is. It's just a collection of people who are collaborating towards a common goal. And so the moment that you remove the concept of the organization and you come down to the fundamental reality that this is just a collective of individuals, they're people who are working towards a common goal. Well, now you have to ask yourself, well, what are some of the things that can go wrong when people work together? <laughs> what are some of the things that can go wrong when, when people communicate with, with one another? And what are some of those friction points? And so when you ask that question, it starts to become much more obvious why emotional intelligence is important. Well, it's important because it helps us to be able to collaborate and function in an effective way. When leaders are emotionally intelligent, a lot of the research shows that it creates a space and an atmosphere where people feel comfortable coming forward and giving their best work. If you're to look at your own experience and ask yourself, how did you perform when you were working with a leader that inspired you and that believed in you and that cared about you as a human being versus a leader who just wanted to pump a number out of you, how did that change your performance? How did that yeah. change the way that you showed up? And so there's tons of science today which makes a very clear connection between high performance and effective leadership with emotional intelligence. So that touches the surface as to why it's so important and critical for CEOs and organizations today. Yeah, hundred percent. And 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 the thing is, Jamel. So thank you for that answer. That's a great answer to that question. The the thing is, uh, when you think back on the best boss you've ever had in your life, you're you're gonna think you're gonna think about someone who's who's been very emotional intelligent, emotionally intelligent, right, Jamel? And uh, and so absolutely. I, so thank you for that. Let's. Uh, so there's 15 skills, right? There's 15 emotional intelligence skills that uh, you know we can we can work on every one of them, but. In your in your um, opinion, Jamel, are there are there two or three of those fifteen that are more critical for CEOs, leaders? Uh, you know, are there a couple that kind of bounce off the page? And if you don't get these right, 
you know, the, the, the other 12 or so, you know, like, are there, are there, are there some priorities here in the 15? Yeah, there 100% are some priorities. So the first thing to, to recognize is that all emotional intelligence skills, and I'll name a few just so that we can get a bit of an idea. So things like assertiveness, empathy, problem solving, particularly solving problems when emotions are involved, stress tolerance and resilience. How do you move through difficult times of uncertainty, right? Things like interpersonal skills. How do you develop and build relationships? Empathy would be a part of that. How do you listen to understand and recognize the view and perspective of someone else? So there's a whole range of different emotional intelligence skills. As you said, there are 15 in total, but fundamentally the, the bedrock and the foundation as well as the gateway into all of these skills is self-awareness. Now, when I say self-awareness, it seems like a pretty self-explanatory thing. And if you were to ask yourself, you know, am I self-aware? You'd probably say, yeah, you know, I believe that I'm a self-aware human being. But what we find when we dig a little bit deeper is that most of us are not nearly as self-aware as we believe that we are. So when I use the word self-awareness, what I'm talking about is a deeper level of clarity and insight into what drives me, into what's motivating me, into what my agendas are. And these are not just conscious agendas, they're also unconscious agendas that I may not even be aware of um, are operating at a deeper level. It's what I'm thinking at any given moment. It's what I'm feeling, my emotions at any given moment and how all of those things are contributing to my behavior, my actions, which determine my outcomes, the relationships that I build, and what I'm able to produce from a performance standpoint. So it's self-awareness on a deeper level. And this is a really important thing because I ask all the time in every single one of my sessions, how many of us as leaders feel that we're self-aware? And whenever I ask that question, we always get the answer. I would say 70 to 80% of leaders will raise their hand and they'll say that I am. And I say, okay, fantastic. That's, that's wonderful. Then we go to the numbers, we go to the stats and what do the stats and numbers tell us? Well, they tell us that even though the large majority of us are going to identify as being self-aware, only 10 to 15% of us actually are. So let that sink in. Let that sink in. That means that if you were listening to this and you said, yeah, I think that I'm pretty self-aware, science tells us that there's a 85 to 90% chance that you're not. <laughs> yeah, right, right. This is research that was done by, by Tasha Yurich. She's had a front row seat to leadership development, specifically self-awareness. She has specialized in this and she's a researcher in the field. She's written a book about it. And this is what her research has found. And she even goes on to call these people self-awareness unicorns. And so <laughs> you have to recognize that when we ask that question, it's a lot deeper um, than you think. And one of the things that I'll add to this is that you might be asking yourself, well, why is it that we identify as being self-aware, but we're not actually self-aware. And the reason for that is because self-awareness is like a Libra scale. And so on one side, I have how clearly I am able to see myself. That's where all of us say, yes, of course I'm self-aware. But then on the other side, you have how clearly or how aware are you of how you come across to others? And so if I were to ask your husband how self-aware you are, if I were to ask your wife how self-aware you are, if I were to ask your people, anonymously, how self-aware are you? Will they all give me the same answer as you or would they give me a different answer? What do you think? <laughs> Probably right? different. <laughs> there you go. And so that's typically the area where we fail. So first and foremost, fundamentally, you've got to start with self-awareness. Now, I know you asked for two or three. So would you like for me to build off of that? Or is that maybe a good place to start? Yeah, no, build off of that. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So we'll build off of that. Uh, yeah. I'll kind of simplify the whole thing, right? Because there are 15 different skills and it could sound and get very complicated very fast. So what I like to do is I like to categorize these skills into pushing skills and pulling skills. Fundamentally, leaders need to be effective pushers and they need to be effective pullers. So what do I mean when I say that? Let's start with pushing skills. These are the ones that were more connected to and familiar with when it comes to leadership. A pushing skill is like my ability to be able to communicate. It's my ability to be able to delegate, to assign tasks, to push a message, to mobilize a team, to push people into their discomfort zone, to push people towards performance. And I do that through assertiveness. I do that through coaching, guiding, mentoring, like I mentioned, delegating, et cetera. But all of this is fundamentally categorized by assertiveness. 
It's speaking up. It's saying what's on my mind. It's delegating. It's sending a message to others. Now that's pushing. On the flip side, and by the way, in order to be able to push effectively, there needs to be a certain element there of self-regard and self-confidence as well as independence. I'm not gonna be able to push effectively if I'm very concerned with how someone else is going to see me or if I'm in an underlying way concerned with being liked by someone else or if I need some sort of external approval, right? And so you fundamentally also need a sense of self-regard self and self-esteem, that's pushing. Pulling skills are the ones that are much more challenging today because we don't typically associate them with effective leadership. We don't practice them enough. In the cultural world, we don't really value them as much as the pushing skills. These are gonna be things like empathy. And this deals with your ability to be able to listen and to receive information and to pull that information in. How do I pull information in? Well, I have to get good at asking questions. I have to get good at allowing silence. I have to get good at pausing. I have to be willing to adjust my pace and my speed to the pace and speed of the person that I'm communicating with, which requires for me to momentarily set aside my agenda, my task, the thing that needs to get done, and to actually be present with the individual who's right in front of me. Then I can pull information. I can seek to understand what are they seeing? What are they feeling? What are they understanding? Why is it that they're seeing it one way and not another way? Pulling skills is what gives an executive leader or CEO insight into what's actually happening within the organization from the viewpoint of the person that they're speaking with. And so if we're not able to do that, we end up becoming disconnected, not only from our people, but from the experience of our people, which is fundamentally the reality of what's happening within the organization. So leaders also need to be able to pull information in and allow that to play a critical role in their decision making. So that's a very long winded way to say it. But if I were to recap, the three skills would be first self awareness, that's foundational, that's fundamental. And then bridging off of that, you have empathy, which is your ability to seek to understand others and pull information in. And then you have assertiveness, which is your ability to be able to push others to direct, to delegate, to mobilize towards a common collective goal. Well, that's very, thank you for that answer. It's a, it's a terrific answer. It's, uh, it's thorough. I mean, you know, you, you know a lot about this topic and, uh, and, and so it makes a lot of sense. And those are the three priorities. So the next question is, okay, so if I say I, I want to get better at, at, at one of those three things, let's just take empathy as, a, as an example. I want to get better at that. How hard is it, Jamel, to really move the needle on an emotional intelligence skill, and 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 how do you how do you measure that? I mean, you know, let's say I've done the self assessment. You know, I've I've gone online. I've done the I've done the MHS uh, self assessment. I have uh, you know I've done a debrief with you. I see what I see what uh, hey, this is. This is something I got to get better at. Empathy. How hard is it to, to move the needle? Well, it's it's definitely not easy. And if it was, I'd be out of a job, which is not a bad thing which is not a bad thing, <laughs> you know, the, 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 my goal. And you're a very busy man. You're, you're, you're far from out of a job. I'm very busy. Okay. I think that that tells you a lot, right? And so my goal is to be out of no. a job. Like I would love for Jamel Lindo <laughs> to just no longer be needed. That is the ultimate vision. And it's not going to happen in my, in my timeline. And if it does, oh my goodness, wow, maybe technology. Well, be, that would be awesome. Yes. And so to answer the question, how hard is it to develop emotional intelligence? If you understand what emotional intelligence is, it becomes much easier. If you have the wrong idea about what it is, it becomes impossible, literally impossible. What do I mean, what do I mean by this? Now, the approach that we typically take to leadership de development and behavioral change is let's get all of our people into a room and do a one hour session and then they'll walk out and they'll know everything that they need to know. And they'll change all of their behaviors. This is typically what happens. We see it also happening with DNI, right? Well, let's just do the DNI, you know, workshop or workshop series, and then all of our people will behave inclusively. Now, when I say it like this, it sounds like a ridiculous idea, but this is legitimately the strategy that many organizations employ in order to change behavior. And what that means is that we fundamentally don't understand behavior and how to actually change it. And so you have to know what that actually looks like. On one side, you have the introduction of a concept or an idea. 
So this is teaching something. This is giving you exposure to what something is. This is definitions. This is looking at examples of how it can apply, et cetera. That information doesn't translate necessarily to behavioral change. It can, but the large majority of the time, it's not going to. And so when you want to change behavior specific to emotional intelligence and really anything that deals with social skill, you have to go through four different stages. And so the first stage is the concept. That's the idea. That is, you know, reading a new article. That is attending a webinar. That is reading a book, all of those kinds of things. But that's only step number one. That's the concept. Step number two is you actually have to go out and experiment. So you have to take the concept and apply it. This is what typically doesn't happen. There are usually no external support systems for the practical application of what leaders are learning in webinars. And so again, step number two, you have to now experiment, you have to apply what you've learned. Once you experiment and you apply something new, then you're gonna get an experience. Something will change, something will shift. And I'm gonna contextualize this later so that we don't get lost in the concepts. So you experiment and you're gonna get a different outcome of some sort. It's either the outcome you want or the outcome that you don't want. And that leads to the final step, which is reflection. You've got to look back. What was the new action or behavior that I demonstrated? What was the outcome that I produced? Is that the outcome that I want? Or is that the outcome that I do not want? At which point now I can refine and I can change my approach. It's only after going through those four steps many times that you actually start to develop emotional intelligence skills. Now, yeah. we have to really concretize this idea of skills development through application and going through those four steps, not getting locked in step number one, which is just the introduction of new ideas and concepts. So to answer your question more directly, developing emotional intelligence is simple, but it's not easy. And the reason why it's not easy is because the moment that I decide that I am going to take on a different behavior, I'm going to be met with the friction of my own discomfort. Right. Now, many of us, when we experience that friction, we see that as a sign to not move further. And we allow ourselves to be discouraged because of that discomfort. When in reality, that discomfort is a sign that you're developing a new skill, that you're doing something new. Therefore, you want to continue. You want to push through. It is the hallmark of learning and development. If there's no discomfort, then you're not actually doing anything. No skills development is happening. No new behavior is being cultivated. Now, let's ground some of this because your question fundamentally was about empathy. What if you yeah. do the assessment and then you identify that empathy is gonna be the area that we're gonna hone in on and develop? So where I start with every single one of my clients is the exact same. And it's gonna sound like deceptively simple. You'd be like, why do people even hire you to do this? Yeah. And I'll, I'll explain why. So we just start with the 80-20 rule. We say, I want you to go out there and every day have one to two conversations where you employ the 80-20 rule. What is that? That means that 80% of the time you're going to be listening, 20% of the time you're going to be talking. And in that 20% of talk time, you're going to be focused on asking open-ended questions. And so we go, go out and practice this. By the way, everything that we do from a coaching perspective is action-based. What matters is what you do, not the conversations that we have. The conversations that we have, which are the coaching sessions, are about the action that you're applying. And so the, the central point of a really good experiential learning experience is always what's actually happening with that leader. It's out there on the field. That's really important. Otherwise, you get locked into concepts. So now coming back to this idea, they go out there now and they start applying the 80-20 rule. Now the question becomes, are, are they gonna be able to apply that rule successfully? And so if they go out there and they can apply it successfully, we pick the wrong thing. That's not an actual challenge or an opportunity for them, <laughs> yeah. right? Because it's too easy. But yeah. so what will happen is they're gonna go out there, apply the 80-20 and there, there are going to be all of these friction points. It's gonna be very difficult for them. And so they may go out there and, and, and realize that, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't shut up. <laughs> I, I, I have to talk. 
Mm -hmm. I, I need to occupy the center stage. I, I don't know why, but for some reason, I, I feel that I, that I need to. Or they may go out there and, and employ that rule and realize they don't actually want to listen. Now, wh why don't they want to listen? They may not want to listen because they believe that they already have the answer. Why would you listen to someone if you already have the answer and you already know? So when they start noticing all of these different friction points, we can come back now to a coaching session and say, well, how did it go? And of course, they're going to say, well, it went terribly. And then we ask, well, why did it go terribly? And they start describing some of the things that are interfering with their simple assignment to go out and just not say anything, right? And so this is the reason why self-awareness is the fundamental building block into all emotional intelligence skills, because ultimately at the end of the day, what is preventing us from being able to demonstrate those skills are fundamental beliefs that we have yeah. about interactions about people, about leadership. One of those fundamental beliefs is because I'm the leader, I have to have all the answers or I have to be the center or I have to be the one who's always speaking. And if I'm not, I'm not an effective leader. If you have that belief system, and by the way, these aren't conscious things. We don't go into interactions consciously thinking that. We believe it subconsciously and informs our behavior. If you go into an interaction, that's your fundamental belief, you'll never listen. Because if you listen, you're an inadequate leader. So why would you listen? And we go through all of that and we, we decipher it and we reframe and, and recreate and deconstruct beliefs and reconstruct beliefs so that they can actually go out there and have more meaningful, empathetic interactions. And it's through that experience that it all begins to develop. So that was a lot. Does that answer your question? Is there more there? It, it answers the question extremely thoroughly, you know, and, 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 but it's a great, it's a great example. If it's, if it's too easy, when you go out there, you're working on the wrong thing, right? It's, you got to put yourself in an uncomfortable uh, position where, it, where, you know, it, 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 it hurts uh, to, to try to make the change uh, and you got to work hard at it. Don't you, I, I, you got to be highly motivated to, to, to make, uh, to make a change. I want to just, uh, you know, uh, we need to wrap up fairly soon, Jamel, but uh, a couple of quick questions. Uh, and and uh, how can we show up as our best selves? I remember a, a CEO roundtable that you spoke at and, you know, you talked about showing up as our best selves for, for our family, for our clients, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, for everybody that we come into contact with. Uh, and, uh, can you just share with us a couple of uh, thoughts on how we can, and you've touched on some already, right? I mean, everything you've talked about so far, if we implement it, we can, we're, be we're better. Uh, but just a couple of thoughts on that, Jamel. And then I got a final question for you and then we'll wrap up. Okay, sounds good. So the first thing is we have to ask ourselves, what does being my best self look like? You would be amazed at how many of us don't actually take time to stop, pause and ask, who do I want to be? First and foremost, fundamentally, not what do I want to be and not what title do I want to hold, not what award I want to get next or what accolade I want to achieve, but who, what qualities do I want to be able to demonstrate? What core values do I hold that are deeply personal and important to me? What, what are those things? What are my principles? How do I want to navigate as a human being on this planet. And so I think that the first thing that we've got to do is take some time in silence, actually develop a framework for who it is that we want to be. That's number one. We've got to establish clarity there. Yeah. Once we have some idea, some concept as to what that looks like, then the second thing we have to do is we have to identify, well, how am I showing up right now? Am I demonstrating these values? Am I not demonstrating these values? Am I you know, am I falling short in some of these areas? Am I exceeding my goals in some of these areas? So you have to ask that question. And you're not really able to ask that question effectively alone. So your own view and perspective of yourself is only half of the puzzle. You have to seek feedback from others externally as well, and really cross-reference your own view with how others are actually experiencing you. Do they see that you value these things? Would they agree that these are your core principles? Would they agree that these are the key characteristics that you demonstrate each and every day? How are you showing up, not only for yourself, but through the eyes of others? And once you have both of those images now, or both of those ideas, and they're clear, now you can fill in the gap. What are some of the discrepancies? And when you are clear about those discrepancies, you can create a solid plan to begin closing the gap between who you are now and who it is that you would like to be. 
And by the way, this is not a final process. And so when you become, or when you become closer to that ideal version of yourself, that's not an endpoint. That's not a checkpoint. There is no top of the mountain here. Really, that's just an opportunity for you to refine and, and then raise the bar again. This is a, this is a continuum. It will go on and till the end of your life. No, hundred percent, hundred percent. No, well, well, thank you for that. Uh, that that those are good good suggestions on how we can show up as our best selves. The last question I want to ask you, Jamel, is, uh, you know, here we are. Can we call this post pandemic yet? I don't know, but we you know we could kind of we could kind of see light at the end of the tunnel. And do do you feel that there are qualities uh, that are really important for the post pandemic CEO, the post pandemic leader, you know, as we come out of this, what qualities, just a couple of qualities do you think are vital for, uh, you know, for, for leaders in this, in this era? Yes. So the key emotional intelligence skill, and you're hearing it a lot more as a buzzword these days, especially as we transition out of the pandemic is going to be empathy. Now, why do I say empathy? Because the entire landscape right now, the workplace market has shifted drastically. So traditionally, all the power has been in the hands of the employer who says, this is the job, this is how much I'm going to pay you. And if you, if you don't like it too bad, I mean, I'm obviously being a little bit over the top with that, but fundamentally that's the way that it's been in the past. Today, there are so many more options and choices and we're seeing this shift of power from the employer uh, to the employee, which means that the employee can now choose. They have a lot of options ahead of them. They can now decide, do I want to do my line of work and do I want to work from home or do I want to go into the office? There are many organizations who offer both. Some only offer one. And with the employee being more empowered and having a lot more choice in front of them, now the quote unquote war for talent has just become even more real. So we have to be able to seek to understand the view and the perspective of others. We need to know what individuals value, what matters to them. And we have to start really tailoring our employee experience to what the market is actually looking for. Above and beyond that, we have to recognize that globally, we're going through a series of very difficult situations emotionally. And so our ability to be able to create a space where employees feel that they can be vocal about where they're actually at on a mental, emotional level is going to be critical. And so if leaders need to be able to facilitate some of those conversations to clear the air, so to speak, as to not just impose the workload onto the employee without understanding, well, what is the actual context of how they're experiencing not only their lives, but also what's happening at a very global level. So we have to be able to create a space where we can have those kinds of conversations, the DEI conversations, all kinds of conversations. And so a leader's ability to lean into empathy at this time as we make these transitions is critical. It is, it is absolutely critical, Jamel. And, 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 and let me, let me, uh, let me, let's close on this thought. And I, and I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your busy schedule, because I know you are in very high demand uh, because leaders are starting to get it, aren't they? Leaders are starting to get it. Daniel Goleman said that, you know, emotional intelligence is the sin qua non, <laughs> the fundamental thing uh, for great leaders. And, you know, the, another person that is a higher reference point for me on emotional intelligence, as you are, is, is Carolyn Robertson. And she says, you know, uh, great leaders know self. Great leaders know self. And in my experience, as people move up an organization, their empathy tends to go down. It tends to go down. You get a little further away from the people. It gets a little bit more lonely. Goldman calls it the CEO disease. It's the leadership disease. You know, you, you're not quite in touch with the people. And what, what I hear you saying is the leaders of today, because the, you know, the playing field has changed a lot uh, as we come out of the pandemic and, and as you know, things are happening, that you've just got to ramp up uh, the empathy, uh, turn the volume up on empathy. You know, you talk about the dials, eh, uh, Jamel, turning up the volume on empathy is just absolutely critical. So for everyone on the call who wants to really kick it up a notch, this is the man that you want to get in touch with. 
talk to Jamel, contact Jamel, and you know, like get at it. And because uh, intellectually, most of us want to get get better at emotional intelligence. We've got to do the hard work, as you've explained, Jamel. We've got to do the hard work. So I just want to thank you so much for being with us. Uh, you know, I really appreciate you being here. I could talk with you for hours about this. You are so. <laughs> You are so articulate, uh, you're passionate about this topic, but you're extremely knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about it. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today and sharing your insights and your thoughts. Thank, thank you. you, Jim. Thank you for having me. Thank you.